thank you everyone who is online and also in the room with us for our third event in a series, Conversations in Diversity, Hidden Disabilities. Today, we are going to talk about um, mental illness. So I'm really excited to have our panelists here. Uh, we have three in person. We also have one person joining us online um, to talk about mental illnesses. And as I've said previously, the whole reason that we're doing the series is because we are attempting to build community and also extend the definition of what diversity, equity, and inclusion means. A lot of times people just assume it's about race and gender, and that is a part of it, but it's not everything. When we talk about hidden disabilities, these are illnesses and sicknesses and um, disorders that affect more than 60 million Americans. They are things that we can't always see. So one might not know that someone has it unless they disclose that information to you. So we're really trying to talk about some issues that affects everyone, faculty, trainees, postdocs, staff, and just have decrease some stigma and have some open and honest and informative conversations. So to get started, I would like for my panelists to introduce themselves, starting with Aaron on the end, and then Shemaine, um, once uh, Julia and Tao introduce themselves, I'll, I'll have you go last but not least. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Aaron Brennan. Um, I'm an assistant professor at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Uh, I'm over at the psychiatric hospital where I'm the director of psychotherapy training for the residency program, uh, as well as being a member, uh, a psychologist on uh, the psychosis team, where I get to work uh, both in research as well as serving individuals um, with serious mental illness as well as post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and I've been here for like two years, so I decided to move across country in the middle of a pandemic, which is less fun than it sounds. <laughs> Hi, I'm Julia. I work at Vanderbilt University Counseling Center as a nurse, and um, I work under the psychiatrist and the psych nurse practitioner in your team. Uh, previously worked at the UMC as a neuroscience board. Hi, I'm, I'm Tao. I am an MD PhD student. I am in my fifth year um, in the graduate uh, program in molecular physiology and physics. Um, I am here as part of my, um, as a student and also a person with lived experience with uh, mental illnesses. And, um, and I would also like to disclose that um, it's not all, only personal, I uh, professionally or clinically, I would like to become a psychiatrist. And um, obviously my research uh, also has some uh, components of neuroscience and uh, physiology uh, in there as well. Thank you, Shemaine. Hi all, my name is Dr. Shemaine Arfuso. I'm a professor at Fresno State um, University. I teach in women's gender sexuality studies as well as Chicano and Latin American studies. Um, I am a scholar of disability justice and I am also, uh, I have PTSD and uh, the comorbidities that came from that, which is fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue. So I come to you as an expert in the scholarship, uh, but also with lived experience. And I also do pretty extensive uh, policy consulting on social determinants of health. Okay, thank you for sharing. So we're gonna get started with just a, a few questions I wanted to cover with you all. The first question I wanted to um, start with uh, Tao and also Julia, what are mental illnesses? I think it's important to distinguish between mental health and mental illness. Um, those two can be used interchangeably in the public world, but um, mental illness is a condition of mental health, like physical health is um, can have stemming illnesses as well. So 
It can be a lot of things. Commonly, depression, anxiety. It can be personality, mood disorders, um, schizophrenia. I'm sure you have a long list as well. Um, <laughs> but, but generally, yes. I think I agree with Julia that um, for me, at least, I think of mental illness as part of um, a continuum of health. Um, so there's health and there's illnesses, but I also think of um, the, uh, I, I think it is, is important, at least for me, to, to think about mental health and mental illness as one continuum, but they can also be separated as well in terms of for example, I think it's easier to think about a physical condition. So I have my physical health and maybe I have hypertension or maybe I have high lipids um, and that needs to be treated and that's an illness, but it doesn't mean that me, myself as a whole person is ill. Um, so there is the well-being component. So I can be ill mentally or I can be ill physically, but I feel well emotionally and I think it's important for me and uh, for others around me who take care of me or who interact with me is important um, for them to, to, to think about me that way as well as, um, so yeah. The only thing I'd add to the question of what is a mental illness is the idea that if we're really look, thinking sort of like diagnostically and really looking at, at helping somebody identify that core to every experience that a person has that ultimately gets defined as a mental illness is that on some way it's impairing their ability to function, right? So I can have lots of experiences, right? I can hear voices. I can have fears that people are trying to harm me. Um, I can have memories intruding. But if I can kind of live my life and sort of be a butcher, baker, candlestick maker, assistant professor, um, it isn't a mental illness. It's an experience that I'm having. And so differentiating between that we can have symptoms, we can have experiences that many of us can have, but really it becomes that point where it sort of it impairs, it sort of, it's, it's making it difficult to live this full life that I want to have. Thank you for that. Uh, Shemaine, did you want to add anything? Um, I appreciate Erin, you bringing up the diagnostic piece um, and really just sort of leaning into how it impacts life. Um, when we look at it from a disability justice perspective, we're looking at how um, structures, institutions uh, are also ableist and limit disabled people's ability to participate fully in systems. So that's all I'd like to add. Thank you. So my next question is, what is the prevalence of mental illnesses broadly? I pulled some statistics on this. I don't know if anyone else brought some statistics with them, but I'm happy to jump in. I'm like pretty fired up about this. <laughs> so um, the CDC says that 26% of adults have a functional disability. So that's what we more commonly know as physical disabilities. Um, Aaron, maybe you can pop in later to add how many people actually have mental illness. Um, but what's important in that when we're looking at education is 12% of students enrolled in a post-secondary program also report a disability. But I want to add some caveats to these things. Um, COVID has increased um, our prevalence of disability significantly. Um, a fourth of hospitalized patients will develop long COVID. Um, we saw 1.2 million more disabled people at the end of 2021. Um, and we need to understand social determinants of health here and that one in three people don't have access to adequate health care or can't uh, access, uh, we have shortage, chronic shortage of providers, so it's hard to get in and get those assessments. So when we're talking about the general population, there's a lot of people that have undiagnosed mental illnesses and aren't able to access uh, treatment, support, and accommodations for those mental illnesses. Erin, I'm hoping you can help me here on the prevalence of mental illness. Sure. Uh, I did the same thing. I looked up online. I said, I got assigned the prevalence. I went, oh, I don't know that. Uh, so <laughs> the point is, it's about 15% of people have 
um, uh, either a, men a mental illness or um, a substance abuse problem. About 10% of people have a mental illness. Um, anxiety disorders, which are things like sort of your um, uh, so like social anxiety disorder, um, kind of like worrying about the future, generalized anxiety disorder. Uh, that's about, um, that's a little bit higher of a prevalence, not much. Depression is, is next. When we look at people who have what's referred to as a serious mental illness, about 5.8% of the population has a serious mental illness. Um, and then about 1% of the population has uh, schizophrenia. And so kind of looking at it, um, that doesn't mean that 1% of the population um, it means that people who are sitting with, people who are talking with online, you know, very well, you could be sitting right next to somebody at the water cooler who has schizophrenia um, and is sort of living their life. And so understanding that they, that people oftentimes move back into, you know, the idea of recovery is that they're really moving back into their life. So that's sort of a snapshot of the prevalence. Thank you all for sharing that because you brought up several things that I was thinking about. Shami, first of all, Thank you for bringing up long COVID. We're going to have a discussion about long COVID and uh, hidden disabilities next Thursday at this same time. Please tune in. Second of all, what I learned when I was watching The View, which I want to do, um, is that I saw that a, um, a recommendation was released saying that anyone under the age of 65 who is in, living in America needs to be tested for anxiety. And that's something new since the pandemic. And when I heard that it was, um, I didn't have anything very articulate to say. It was just, wow, how much anxiety is going on because of the pandemic and how we've had to respond to it where they're saying, everybody, get a flu shot, get a COVID shot and take your anxiety test. Uh, but then that also uh, goes back to what Shamin was saying and the availability of resources for people who do have anxiety or who do have, a, may need a diagnosis, you know, how do they go? To, what happens when we have so few providers? But we won't answer that one just yet. That's coming up. The next thing I, that I wanted to talk to you all about or have you all talk to everyone about is um, the some of the stereotypes and stigmas that are associated with mental illness. A lot of the hidden disabilities have stigma associated with them, but I think especially for the mental illnesses, they have um, a particular stigma, scariness associated with them. So um, what are some of the, the stereotypes or stigmas associated with mental illness and how can we combat those? Uh, I'll start with Tao. Thank you. I think um, for me, some of the stigma or stigmatizing experiences or stereotypes that um, I think about and I've been on the receiving end of things um, could be ranging from um, anywhere from, you know, like I think we've been doing a good job of defining what mental illness is, uh, but because we think of mental illness, we think it has to do with the brain, which is true. And because the brain is such an important organ in the body, um, I'm not biased or anything, uh, <laughs> that like people, that, that it's easy for, for it to be, um, I guess, um, in, like people would think that it's scarier than it, it, it could be. Um, like a person with depression could have depression and be receiving treatment for it but it doesn't mean that they would act a certain way or they would be depressed all the time. They can't go to work, they can't function. I mean, there are people who experience that those kinds of ex experiences, but it doesn't mean that um, that is the same for everybody. So having people having one common diagnosis doesn't mean that they would have the same experience um, and the timing of it can be important too, in terms of, um, you know, because mental illness, I think of it as a chronic illness with flares and remission. And without talking to the person, it's, uh, it's hard to set, it's impossible to tell. Um, and, and I think people do make assumptions of, oh, you know, if a person has a mental illness, they must be 
you know, not functioning all the time. Um, whereas one can be um, in recovery or re in remission or receiving treatments for it, just like somebody with Crohn's disease or with hypertension or with diabetes who needs insulin every day. I mean, I guess some of the other stigma pieces that come out when we're thinking about things like anxiety disorders and depression, you know, depressed people, the stigma becomes that they're just lazy, right? If they just get up and go for a walk, they feel better. Um, or anxiety, so, oh, they're just worrying. It's not like, what are they worrying about, right? My Aunt Mildred, she worries, right? Like, and so not really understanding as we sort of minimize those experiences that worry is like an avalanche that hits you, right? It's not this thing that like, oh, I'm worried whether I'm going to get home, pick up my son on time today, right? Like, it's it, it all encompassing and, and almost, you know, really almost impossible to break away from. And so when we're like, oh, well, they worry, who cares? Just do your job or, you know, just get your assignment in. It's way more crippling than that. And then on the other side, when we look at people who, are, who have um, things like psychotic disorders, the stigma around them as individuals who are dangerous, um, people wonder, why don't, why don't people talk about it? Why don't people let them? Well, nobody's putting ribbons on the back of their car for psychosis. I mean, like nothing personal. And so this idea that these individuals have become dangerous, and if they disclose it, people are going to think they're dangerous. The statistics show that an individual with a psychotic disorder is more likely to be injured by another person than to ever harm somebody. And yet every news report says we need to stop these dangerously mentally ill people. Every politician, that's what they say. I'm just tired of sending messages to them um, and have them bounce back. So the stigma really marginalizes these individuals and makes them afraid to enter the workplace, talk about their experience, ask for help in the workplace, because for some of these, it, it really is, um, uh, the stigma is really puts them in a place of not wanting to act and ask for help. In reality, these individuals, um, whether they engage in treatment or they find their own way to get better, they live wonderful lives and, and have that ability toward recovery. Um, I'd like to, ask, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Shemaine, and then Julia. Um, thanks, Erin, for talking about, you know, the stigmas associated with sort of like institutionalism and putting folks away. Um, when we look at disability justice, you know, our history around dealing with mental illnesses was focused on locking people up, on institutionalizing, on segregating them. And, you know, about in the 60s or 70s, there was a shift um, to support independent living. But, you know, we haven't gotten rid of those stigmas. And so it's sort of like all or nothing in the world, right? People think that either you have a mental illness and you need to be institutionalized or you're just this completely able-bodied person, right? But mental illness can really exist on a, a spectrum. And um, Aaron and Julia can attest to this in diagnosis. Part of diagnosis is the severity of a mental illness and how much it impairs your daily life. So, you know, with those stigmas, you know, there's things around, uh, 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 I, forgot. Um, Tao. Tao, you brought it up when we met before about uh, thinking that we're fragile, right? Like not being able to, um, we can't handle hard things. We can't handle, you know, being pushed. We can't handle a heavy workload. Um, but that's not true. Again, that's a stigma. That's a stereotype. And in a lot of ways, um, if you meet a uh, if you meet a disabled person with a mental illness who's out in the workforce that maybe you don't know about, I know for me with PTSD and my chronic illnesses, I'm actually really good at prioritizing my time because I know that those flares are coming, right? I know that it's inevitable they are coming. So I structure my life in a way to make space for that. And so I'm like the opposite of a procrastinator, if that makes any sense. It does. Uh, and Julia, what did you want to add? It's pretty much been covered. Um, but just that there are stigmas based on what we see in culture. And the more general ones don't receive as much um, attention or lack of 
um, trust with that kind of person. Whereas if you were to meet someone and they disclose a more rare um, mental illness, similar to what you said, people might treat them more childlike or unable to um, continue in the work or not eligible for promotions or um, different things like that. So since you want to run up a couple of things uh, that the stigma, the stigmas are very ingrained in our culture. One, how do we, how do we address those stigmas beyond writing to our leaders and saying, hey, saying someone was a crazy lone wolf does not, does not serve people who have actual mental illnesses. How do we, how do we address those stigmas to decrease them and create a better understanding of what mental illnesses are and what they are not? You don't have to solve the problem, just a suggestion or two. <laughs> few thoughts that I've had in mind. Um, I think, and, and I think there have been efforts around campus, um, but also, you know, nationally um, in terms of normalizing the conversations surrounding mental illness, like us having this kind of conversation is a start. And I think having um, students, who are, well, I guess, first create psychological, least like psychologically safe space for students to to disclose and, and receive um, support from one another um, would be really helpful um, in, in seeing the vulnerability or the disclosure model by faculty, near peers. Um, I think those things could be um, really helpful in terms of encouraging people to speak out and get help and, and, and be reminded that they're not alone in their experience. Um, some of the other pieces, I think um, there's continues to be a lot of, um, we talk about, you know, the, the system. So, so there's individual stigma, but then there's also institutional stigma in terms of um, having a process that a student needs to go through in order to get access or um, to get treated for mental illness. And, and I feel like you know, standardizing that and, and and having language around that that would treat mental illness just like other, you know, any other physical conditions uh, would be really helpful. Uh, yeah. Um, and not trying to solve the problem uh, fully. Um, I, I think as, um, I, as part of leadership and developing our culture, um, and really talking here at Vanderbilt um, about um, when a, another faculty member or a student or, or anybody comes and discloses, um, making sure that we have this balance of an open conversation, saying, well, you know, asking, you know, as much as willing to say, what is it like for you? What can I do to be helpful? Um, while not necessarily trying to sort of like have them run down everything that's going on, because then that becomes intrusive. Um, but being open and that the conversation is always about you know, thanking them, valid, you know, um, uh, really not validating, but, but showing that you value the trust and then really seeing what's going to make it easier, what's going to make it harder, how can I be sort of an ally in, 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 make, in helping you work at your best? And then not making it maybe a one-time conversation, but having times when you check in going, hey, how is this working for you? Right, which I think gives them a chance to go, great, and then be done with the conversation or go, hey, can we talk about this? But it being something that we support um, individuals as they come uh, back in, you know, when they come back in um, and really respecting them if there's time that they have to take away so that they can feel that as they return back into the situation, like let's say if um, an individual needs to maybe go to the hospital or need some time, as they enter back in, is there anything you need? And so the space is open to have that conversation, but they can sort of return back to their work and not feel really anxious about what's happened. Thank you for sharing that. That was one of the questions we were going to cover later, but no, it's great because our conversation is awesome, but also we're running short on time. So thank you for bringing that up. Another issue that I wanted to talk about that occurs specifically with mental illnesses uh, is the how mental illnesses occur different 
or are treated different culturally. For example, um, as an African-American woman, when I started seeing a therapist, which I recommend everybody do, they're awesome. Um, when I started seeing a therapist, um, it was frowned upon in my church community because there is a belief for a lot of people, not everyone, that a little extra virgin olive oil on the forehead and a prayer will solve everything. And if that doesn't solve everything, then you're not trying hard enough. So I know that is true for some parts of the African-American culture. Can you all speak on that, on what some of your experiences have been, Shameen and Tao? Shameen? Yeah, um, so I'm Cuban-American um, and raised in California, so uh, very around the Mexican culture as well. And, you know, I just want to kind of take us back to that historical piece again, right? Institutionalism, um, putting folks away. We also have a severe history of medical violence against people of color, brown and black bodies. And so I think um, in the Latino community, probably in the black community as well, you know, this, there's this real still lived fear of institutionalism. There's this lived fear of, you know, having our children taken away from us, right? Like all of these ways in which we've been violent, violated historically for showing any sort of weakness whatsoever. So in Latino culture, you know, it was kind of like suck it up or, you know, take, excuse the folks who speak Spanish in here, but we have a thing called me, me vale madre. It's a, it's a tincture. It's like a, it's a different herbs in it, which you see um, in use for anxiety traditionally anyways, but it's like, you know, a focus on taking herbs um, and then just sort of suck it up. And then we don't talk about it. And, you know, I've seen a lot um, in my family and uh, my husband's family, you know, just sort of what happens over time when these mental illnesses are not caught when we're children, right? Because, uh, you know, there's that mistrust of doctors, you know, there's a fear of the medication that they push and um, how those things compound in our community, right? So if major depressive disorder or anxiety, or for me, PTSD when I was 17 doesn't get treated properly in those critical brain development times, um, they compound with time right and then you find comorbidities happening and other issues happening as a result so um you know to wrap around to the last question you know about what we can proactively do and you know it's kind of like we can't make these conversations an afterthought right we need to be like pro in them pro disability from the get-go um, like Tao said, I disclose to my students every semester um, that I live with mental illness because I know that, um, you know, 90% of my class are Mexican-American students um, and probably, like Erin said, 15% of them have an undiagnosed mental illness that has not been addressed. Thank you for sharing. Tao, what, what do you have? Um, I, I think at least and from my experiences, and we talk about, and, and again, I think is going back to your idea of DAI, DEI being more than just race and culture. Because even for me, from you know my background, somebody from a very similar background as me, their upbringing might be very different and their definition and experience of stigmas, uh, and understanding of mental illnesses can be very different. So I think acknowledging that we can't, like our experience is, you, like, is ours and other people will have theirs and, and clarifying the assumptions um, that we might have um, might be helpful uh, to, to address the barriers. Um, especially when mental illnesses are being talked about and um, somebody who's from a different culture um, or family even. Julia? Yeah, um, this is interesting. Something we see at the UCC, um, it's really great. A lot of people come and they receive a diagnosis that brings clarity to things they've been feeling and it's affirming. But when they receive that, it can be linked with a medication that might really help them. And um, so overcoming the cultural barrier, if someone 
is international um, or if they're from here, that is difficult in itself, but then having another stigma of medication can be difficult. So I meet with students after they've received a diagnosis and they're teetering whether or not they want to go and be scheduled with one of our medication providers. And a lot of those conversations revolve around family stigma. Um, and it's easy to want to just stamp the westernized individual. This is going to make you better. You don't have to tell them. But there is such something to hold that would, you know, honoring the family and honoring their culture is honoring them. So it's a tension. And I think it can be difficult. Um, there's not always a clear way. Yes, there are no monoliths. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're going to skip around a little bit because uh, for we're short on time. But I do want to make sure that we talk about what types of accommodations are available uh, for different um, disabilities. And I think there's a, we talked about a speech software that someone needed in the process of getting it, but I don't remember who talked about it. That was Tao. Was it, okay, Tao, do you wanna talk about it for us, please? I think it might be helpful to, to hear from the professionals first, and then I'll, I'll chime in with my um, opinions or, or experience. Uh, yeah. Um, I think what, I, what, what I'm thinking about, you know, collaborating with an individual and serving, um, around, you know, thinking about what accommodations. It's less about saying, this is your diagnosis, let's give you these accommodations. Um, it's, it's more about saying, how can we make things easier so it works, right? It's very just pragmatic. It's just the way my brain works. Um, and so it also sort of tags with the question before, is like, how do you disclose? And so a lot of times I have conversations, not that, I said, first of all, you should disclose. If you want to go in and say, this is what's happening, I have schizophrenia out here, voices sometimes, you should do that. Live your best life. I mean, and I, and I support them and talk about like how that might go. The other thing is your business is your business. Their business is their business. Tell them what you need. There are times where I have trouble focusing because there's things that really distract me. For this one person, it might be auditory hallucinations. Um, there's times where I have real trouble focusing in a really big area because they might have a persecutory delusion, right? So then we write up what they need and, and, then, and then identify what those accommodations are. It might be that they need sort of a more closed space. They might need, uh, if it's a student, they might need uh, time to take the test uh, where they can sort of take uh, breaks. But it's really, you know, sort of a, um, a, like tailoring what they need to give them the accommodations to be successful. Um, and also thinking about what can we do when I'm working with serving an individual to make it so you might not need some of these. So ultimately, we continue to empower um, and solve those problems so that they feel even more and more capable as they go forward. Um, I was going to say, I think I really agree with um, Aaron in that the accommodations or access that the, a student might need might be very different depending on um, the individual's needs and state of training and things like that. Um, and I, I wish that could be, you know, something that a student can come to the advisor or their faculty and not have to disclose all of the details about their illness or circumstances in order to attain or get access to the accommodations that they would, uh, would need to be successful in the course or in the training. Um, so I think realizing that there are flaws in the systems, that yes, we have the systems in place to, to kind of you know, be um, the referee between faculty and students and you know, who's gonna be the middle person to decide what are the accommodations needed, but recognizing that the systems can be very bureaucratic and can take a lot of time. Um, especially if the students is really needing help and is in crisis. I'm just thinking about, you know, the people who might have needed the help and didn't have the space or time or ability to, to go through all of that. Um, we are entitled to an interactive process through ADA accommodations, but it doesn't take anything for a professor 
to just give you the accommodations, to just serve you. Um, we've turned disability into a human resources issue where things have to go through these processes and protocols and universities have forgotten who they serve as a student population now, right? Our student populations have changed, they have evolved. Um, we're serving lots of first-generation students, um, in, um, international students, uh, students not coming from wealthy backgrounds, right? And like Tao said, she endured this year and a half process to get diagnosed. And that could be even lucky. My son's been waiting two years to get in to see a child psychologist to get screened for ADHD. And so we need to really think as a university, knowing that our population is becoming more disabled, we need to be preemptively thinking about how to make our spaces more inclusive. So it can't be an afterthought, right? It's too late when, you know, Tao's having to like push through to get the software, it takes a year and a half, it didn't help you for three semesters of classes, right? And that puts an undue burden on the student. And so we have this whole um, thing out there called universal design, where you can find ways to make your classes more accessible to more students. And then also back to Aaron's piece about asking students what would make their life easier. And, you know, professors can notice what works in their classroom and what doesn't, and then adjust. And, um, but sometimes we get regimented in how we do things. And we have to recognize that as professors, we have privilege and we have power in the classroom to make our classes more accessible. And the truth is when we make them more accessible for disabled students, we're also making them more accessible for um, black students, for indigenous students, for um, LGBTQ students, we're making it more accessible for all of our students. So thank you, Tao, for that. That was, I was very moved by that. And I just like want to shake <laughs> whoever made you go through that. But it, that's how it is. That's how the system is. Um, yeah, and, and I'm sharing this not, and again, um, my tears and emotions, I think, are coming from not because I had to go through all of that in order to just get a software. It's more of this, this is a test case of, you know, this is the systems of flaw. It's hard to get diagnosed. It's hard to get treatment. And if we require paperwork, if we require formal um, evaluations and things like that, um, then it can be, uh, it then create even more barriers for somebody who was especially in need of support. Thank you all for bringing up all of your points. I have 15 things to say in four minutes. Um, first, Tao, thank you for your vulnerability. I really appreciate that. I honor and respect your tears. To me, it reminds me of the frustration of a process that you don't know that you're getting into until you're there. And then you don't know how to get to the other side because there's no template for it. You just know what you need, but you don't know how to get to the place of what you need and meeting barriers along the way. I, I honor that. Uh, another thing that goes back to what uh, Shami was saying and the, the institutions in which we live and the systems that we have are not really set up. We're never really designed to encounter the problems that we're seeing today. Universities were designed for well-to-do European American sons of wealthy people. That's what, that's how we had our first classes, and then we evolved and started adding more people, but not really honoring where these people were coming from or what their experiences have been. So one of the things that I'm really proud about for what we're doing here at Basic Basic Sciences, we're meeting quite frequently with a committee, with a subcommittee composed of faculty, staff, trainees on how we can really address the mental health needs of our community. So not only our students, but students are in a particular vulnerable space because so much is riding on their ability to be scholars and be mentally well in a challenging situation, but also for our faculty, who are supporting these students and our staff. You know, no one, no community is immune 
from mental illnesses. It's, it's, it's a free for all. And so we really are trying to build a space that is, that is working to make this better for everyone involved. It's something that's very important to me and it's important to the people that are serving on the community as well, on the committee as well. Um, the other thing I had to say was, I just appreciate all of the thoughts that you all shared. Um, and, and I echo what you're saying is that we really need to bring these, these uh, ideas and, and conversations to the forefront so that we're not doing just add-ons because whenever we make accommodations for any group, those accommodations end up helping everyone. Um, and again, you know, Tal, thank you for sharing your story and uh, Shameen too, sharing your personal stories because even though your stories don't represent everybody, you are representing others out there. You're not the only Tal that has had this experience. You're not the only Shameen that's had this experience. And when, when you talk about it, it gives people who are on the outside of the situation an opportunity to see what that experience has been like for somebody else if it's something that they've never experienced. So again, thank you um, so much for sharing everything. Um, as I mentioned before, earlier, most of the panelists are Vanderbilt people. So these are folks that if you wanna have additional conversations and they're open to it, you can reach out to them for you know, more information for additional conversation. You don't have to, but that may be an option for you. And also, Shamin, thank you for joining us. From, yeah, Q&A. Q &A. Oh, from California. And let me check the Q&A before I disconnect. Oh, uh, it's for you, Tal. It says, thank you for, bravery, for your bravery and authenticity and sharing your lived experience with ADHD. Your passion and empathy for helping others is so needed at Vanderbilt in particular. As a fellow adult who is adapting to an ADHD diagnosis and trying to keep working in the healthcare system, you child, your experience and frustration truly resonates and makes me hopeful to stay working here. Thank you. So you all are definitely awesome sauce. Um, thank you for join, joining us and I hope to see you next week when we discuss long COVID. I feel like she mean make, make the I guess the parents. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all and have a great afternoon.